Hello my darlings. This is Miss Darling in the studio and today we're going to be discussing overlapping shapes as a design style for a master board. And as you might already know there are 12 design styles in the fine art world. There are 13 that I've identified in the journal world and this is the one that I don't find listed as a fine art style but of course it's out there there are overlapping shapes everywhere and this is a, a good example now here in this you can see there are squares and rectangles so this falls into the category of overlapping squares and so does this one here there are also some curved lines and that belongs in a another style but today we're going to be talking about overlapping shapes and what do I mean by that I mean all different kinds of shapes and sizes and, and no particular identifiable shape like a rectangle or a circle or an oval uh, these are going to be freeform shapes and so we'll get into that in a minute first uh, let me just remind you, I have links in my Etsy shop and also in the description box below this video. And I've never mentioned this before, but I just thought maybe I might mention, if you're liking some of the jewelry that I wear in my videos, I have links to most of them in the description box below. I like to be supportive of other artisans I'm wearing today, like this wrap bracelet and a couple of turquoise rings and so if you're interested in taking a peek at any of that just check the description box below so let's get started in discussing overlapping shapes first we're going to take a look at some overlapping shapes i found in the fine art world even though it's not listed as one of their official design styles and then we'll take a look at how some of that has been used in the junk journal world and then we'll actually make one so uh, stay tuned stay with me and let's have some fun and creativity and I hope you'll craft right along with me let's first take a look at overlapping shapes in the fine art world here is an old master painting that whose style you might have seen many times is very famous Gustav Klimt and he's famous for his wonderful and varied mosaic-like shapes and patterns, some overlapping and others side by side or one above the other. And I just love his work. It's so intricate and I love all of the textures that the various designs make. Next we have Juan Moreau who is another old master and he became famous because of his overlapping shapes and his whimsical style and use of color. You can see that this is almost very childlike in its presentation and um, he has very interesting artwork. Now we have overlapping shapes which is not a background but the foreground and here we see the face of a woman interspersed and morphing into the face of a lion or vice versa it just depends on which face you see first the other one will be morphing into it here we have butterflies overlapping each other I use overlapping technique constantly and it really doesn't matter what I'm working with I love to overlap and so here we have butterflies they don't have to be a geometric shape these are free form or rep representational and the butterflies fall into the representational category and lastly we see the guitar made visible through the careful placement and colorization of different shapes all uniting into a beautiful whole the artist has used contrast and shape and size and a multitude of uh, interesting elements to make this painting come alive in a very unique and different way. 
But when I think of overlapping shapes, I'm prone to think of overlapping papers or fabrics in odd shapes and sizes uh, that I use for my junk journals. And I start out doing the background in overlapping papers or fabrics or a combination of the two. And after that, as this example shows, I put ephemera on in carefully selected places and I've overlapped them onto the overlapped background. This style of making master boards or journal pages is very common among junk journal crafters and artists. But let's try to take the mystique out of overlapping shapes using collage as our method of application. It's one of my favorite pastimes. I am officially designating this style as overlapping shapes because it has not been, to my knowledge, been given an official name for the design style and it makes perfect sense. We do see overlapping in other design styles for sure, as you can see in some of my latest master boards. Here is a vertical design style where I overlapped various papers into the background using Japanese calligraphy and then embellished the two pages with black stripes, scraps from cuttings of woodblock prints, and fussy cut ephemera. Uh, for instance, the rosebud and the butterfly. In this example, I overlapped fabrics in a vertical design style master board. I have a video available that shows me actually making this particular master board. By ghosting this image into a softer pastel version, it is easy to embellish it for multiple uses. So you don't need to use a master board as is. You can lighten it and maybe even alter the color if you have a computer and design photo editing software. You can do many things. And in this last example, I overlap design papers and textural papers into a diagonal design style master board, uh, creating an asymmetrical pinwheel in the process. And as I said, I do have videos on the channel of how I made these master boards. If you haven't seen them yet, be sure and take a look at them. You can easily find them by choosing the master board playlist from the home page of my channel. So now let's go to work and I'm going to make an overlapping shape master board so you can see my process and I'll try to teach you as I go what my thoughts are and why I'm doing what I'm doing. All right, here is just a piece. This is watercolor paper and it was part of a part of a painting that I had started and never did anything with and I've cut it down now into four sheets, eight and a half by eleven, to use as a background for master boards and so what I'm going to do first I want to do some mark making on here so take whatever you have pencils pens um, markers charcoal uh, whatever you might have on hand that you can you know make marks and I just kind of you know, squiggle all over. It doesn't matter what or where. Most of it's going to get covered up. You know, that doesn't show up. Maybe let's use, use some white. Maybe not going to be too different from that silver. Yeah, it's not, but so, you know, just mark it up however much you want and in whatever colors make sense to you. Alright, so now I'm just going to, in random places, start gluing down some book, book page 
paper that I have. I usually tear off sections of a page where there is no text. Oop. I mean, this is really fine. It's very old, old paper, I think, from the 1800s or the early 1900s. The older it gets, the more delicate it is. And so you have to be a little more careful with it. This is a page from a vintage dictionary. So we use a little of that. I want some lighter color in here. When you're choosing what you're going to use, try to have a mixture from dark to light so that you have some good contrast. If everything is dark or everything is light, it's just not nearly as interesting as it is when you have some nice, good contrast. So, if I have a dark background, for sure I'm going to be looking for some light scraps whatever I'm using to go on top to give me that contrast. All right, uh, now because this is so delicate, I'm going to use, I'm going to use um, a glue stick on it. It still will have a tendency to break away on me, but that can't be helped. But this way, I think I generally stand a better chance of, of uh, getting it to adhere over the entire piece than if I, yeah, see there? It just crumbled right up on me. You, know, you do have to be a little more careful when working with something vintage. Fortunately, when you're doing um, vintage, You don't mind that. You don't mind things breaking apart. I'm going to use a little of this now. I think I'll just tear it by hand. And what I'm doing is I'm going to be spreading this. Oh, how come you don't want to? It doesn't want to adhere at all. What I started to say was, you're just going to be doing things in a very random fashion. I'm going to be just sort of sprinkling things around uh, to get balance and get things uh, fairly um, evenly distributed over the whole board. This will be again another board that is being made to be cut up. This will simply have a different color palette. Boy, that. I guess it's because of the acrylic paint on the paper. This uh, glue stick. 
is having a little trouble. Well, let's try a different place. See if we can get that to lay down. You can glue your text materials all in the same direction. In, in other words, uh, reading it right side up from this vantage point. Or you can turn them sideways as I've done or even upside down. It doesn't matter once it's all broken up and put on, um, you know, broken up into tags and other ephemera. It's not going to really matter whether it's right side up or upside down or anything else. I think we'll cover up that blank spot there on that page. So, and I'm just going to go ahead and pull that off and lay it back down somewhere else because I don't need it to look perfect. I want it to look grungy and old and a bit dilapidated and needing repair. I think we'll just kind of drop that in there. And I think that will kind of do it for us in terms of book pages. So now I have some fabrics here that have a specific color palette that I'm going for in on this particular master board. And so I pre-pick fabrics that I feel work well together. And I look for not only a difference in pattern but a difference in size so we've got some checkerboard here checkerboard here uh, the colors are uh, different and then we have this i don't even know what you'd call that but it's very small pattern and then we have a stripe over here so you want to have at least three different designs um, I think, in order to have enough variety to work with. And then it just depends on what you put down and how much of each one you use. And, um, you know, how much fabric you have to work with. Now for the fabric, I won't be able to use the glue stick. I will be switching to Fabrifix, which is a very popular glue made for gluing fabrics. And um, I'm going to do some tearing. I see as I said earlier, this is where you wind up with all these 
threads that come off of the fabrics and I save everything and you know I just put a little clump off there to the side and and I just you know have a place in my studio where I put it all uh, keep it all in the same place and then over the months and years whatever long you're doing what you're doing you'll see that it builds up and then one day you'll have a use for it so this one I'm going to rip one one side a little bit wider than the other now you can go with strips or you can you know use uneven shapes a little hard to do with with fabric but you know just uh, what I try to do is not think about it too much just kind of do it and keep laying things down until I feel happy and so I'm just going to randomly put some of these down then I'm going to switch to a different fabric and do the same thing trying to always uh, sprinkle a little of each in all four quadrants if you were to divide your master board into four halfway this way and halfway that way you want to have something of interest in all four quadrants so I try to um, sprinkle the same fabric or the same paper uh, around so there may be a greater portion of, of for instance this fabric that that is in quadrant two and three and then a smaller portion that's in one and four um, you know it's not going to be the same same thing everywhere you look. And I think what I'm going to do is take this one and cut it into two smaller pieces. I like being repetitive with color and pattern but not so much with shape. Or size. I get my unity from the repeating colors and patterns but not from the shapes and sizes if that makes sense. And this one, the other one I tore into more like two equal lengths and this time I'm making one deliberately small, smaller than the other. So you see I have more like a small square here, which, you know, could be used in the, like in the middle of something. And then I have a little larger piece. I think we'll go with that so I can cross two quadrants at the same time and I leave these little hanging threads and I just think that it's cool to leave those on if you can Now I'm going to switch to another fabric. I'm 
think I'll start using some of this. I've discovered that some fabrics tear more easily depending on whether you're working with the selvage or against it. So how is everybody? Everybody doing well? My husband just finally was able to get his second vaccination shot a week ago. He did not have any adverse effect from it. I had fever for three days, but he also isn't one to tell me what's going on unless he needs to go to the hospital so he could have had something that was that he had to deal with as a result but won't admit to it if any of you have a spouse that's like that then you know what I what I'm talking about So then I have good spacing. I just need something over in that area, I think, of this particular fabric. Oh. Gets to feeling kind of messy when you not only are working with this rather thick fabric glue, but you get all these threads hanging out everywhere, going every which direction. I think that's about where I had it. Look at the end of my glue bottle. Well, I have to keep this glue pointed downward when I'm using it. Otherwise, it takes forever to come out. And I don't really have something good to stand it in when I'm gluing. I have to figure that out, what I can do. And now, my third fabric, which are stripes. Must be going the right, ripping the right direction this time because it's easier. Hardly have to use any strength at all. Now, let's take a look at where we're at. I have good distribution of my papers my plaids. Maybe could have used a little more plaid over here, but that's about it. And then good distribution with these little 
kind of checkerboard small checks so now I'm going to um, cut these in different lengths and if you notice I've got a vertical shape here and a vertical shape here so I'm going to go with a horizontal placement of this to counteract the two verticals. I don't want to put three vertical shapes in a row side by side. You can if you want, but it's just a design preference on my part. And I don't lay it down with one edge matching the edge of another. I either go above it or below it, but not the exact same location. So I think we'll kind of maybe come up here. Oh, look at that great fraying. It's nice and long. Too bad it'll hardly even show up against that dark background but I have a little bit of it showing over there let's see if I want to place it somewhere else instead then um, hmm. yeah, maybe we can drop that in there I don't try to glue down the fringe area I just leave that alone. So I had horizontal, horizontal, well, horizontal, 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 and horizontal. So it's about time I did something vertical there to counteract that. If that makes sense to you, put in the comment section. That makes sense, Miss Darling. And I'll know you're with me. All right, I got a horizontal and a vertical. So we've got this going on. I could maybe, yeah, I think I'm going to maybe run this something vertically there. All right, I've got there and here and here. I need something down here. A vertical, 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 so I need to put something, maybe crossing all three of those. And that breaks that up a little bit. I will completely have to redo my manicure when I'm done with this. It wreaks havoc on nail polish. All right, what are we looking like at this point? I think it's time to stock with the fabrics. We can always come back and add more later, but I don't want to overdo it and then feel like I haven't left myself room for anything textural. So I'm going to put those off to the side and I'm going to pull out some ephemera to consider and I'll be back. So I've pulled out some ephemera and just kind of loosely placed it here and there. I'm quite happy with the various colors. I've got some dark background here with text on it, fairly sizable text. I've got this teal, um, I suppose it's uh, more for uh, the size of 
to go on a um, Altoid 10. Um, I've got a number here on a tag. I like these numbers. Uh, I'm just trying to fill in the whole board with something interesting that could become quite important once it gets cut up into smaller sizes. So I think at this point I'm just maybe going to go ahead and glue down what I have without um, without waiting further on that and then um, then I can go from there. You know the thing about paper and fabric is if you do something and later you decide you don't like it then just glue something else on top and you don't worry about it. I took my two largest pieces. Why am I not getting anything out? That's really the one really downside of wet glue. Particularly if you have a opening that's quite small so you can control how much glue the wider the opening, the faster it's going to come out, but then you could be having globs of glue that you don't need, and that, that's a waste of the glue, plus it can get messy. Alright, I'm going to just move all this off, and uh, now when I look at this, my halfway point is somewhere in here, and I like, for instance, if this were to wind up being used as a page in a journal, I just prefer having my focal point higher rather than lower, and so I'm going to start out with putting this larger piece on the upper side. Oh, I think I sh would have liked that maybe behind there better. I'm going to lift that up temporarily. I think I would like this overlapping that better than the other way around. So it's important to make those decisions ahead of time rather than like I did as an afterthought. You can glue down what's on the bottom first. So now maybe I can, it's still new enough, I can just pull it back up and re-glue it. If I had used the fabric glue, which maybe I should have done, but I'm glad I didn't now, but if I had used the fabric glue, that would have been a lot harder to pull back up again. I guarantee you. I think that's a great little piece. It was a a part of a different master board that I had cut up and made tags and this was a leftover piece that I didn't use but I glued it to a piece of black cardstock and saved it and of course now I'm using it. And then I'm going to drop this in like, do I want the word staple to show or not? If I let it show, maybe I'll put that up there. Yeah, I think I'll do that. I 
Okay, and then over here, I'm going to drop this big one. My halfway point is, here, let's find out for sure, just to be safe. Five and a half. So my halfway point is there. I tried, you know, uh, with the ephemera um, that I try to stay away from the halfway point in case someone wants to use it as a two pages that are folded or either cut apart. Um, that way you don't have half of it on one side and half on the other. But I don't mind any of the background papers or fabrics. I don't mind them crossing over the halfway mark. Okay, I believe I had that up there. I guess I should finish off this side first before I do anything else. Where did I have this? Was that up there? This teal it grabs all the attention, so I think I had it up here, which will be my center of interest in terms of being a two page master board, but on the other hand, I'm going to fill it up with so crazy full because I intend to cut it that I shouldn't even worry about where that is placed. Maybe I should put it elsewhere. I think I will put it elsewhere. Remember what the purpose of this master board is. It's not being meant to become two pages. It's meant to be cut up. So I want to distribute colors and shapes and sizes all around. All right, I'm going to put this down next. I just got to wondering if this was on, was it actually a sticker? It has this shiny back. I don't think it's a sticker, but we'll glue it down anyway. Stickers can pop up and come off. It's just printed on glossy paper. My fingers are so full of glue, it feels awful.
Okie doke. Now, I had this little piece. in here at this point. So let's consider maybe a couple. But they won't even show up. These are stickers. I've made the mistake from time to time of buying stickers that are on a glossy transparent paper and I do not care for them. I don't care for anything glossy. But these are, they have a little bit of a sheen but it's not high gloss like some of them. I don't think those are even going to show up well enough to be worth wasting them. So I'll just keep the one. It really doesn't matter where you put things when you're creating a master board to be cut. Just get, make it a point of getting good distribution everywhere. That will just give you more opportunity to find specific places of super interest that might be just really boring otherwise. Obviously you can always, after you've cut a tag up, if it's not interesting enough, you can always add something at that point too. So, um, I don't have any red in here. Should I put something red? It's starting to look quite full now. fill it up but keep in mind too another design principle is that the eye needs a place to rest and so we do have places for it to rest
if it wants to. But I didn't turn it sideways so it would fall off. I wouldn't know I missed it. Alright. I am happy with that. And so I will be um, making photocopies of it and with the idea to cut up the photocopies and keep my original intact. Until then, ta-ta! <laughs>